I'm Neil Dawson, um, and my colleague here, Brenda McHugh. We have worked together for uh, a very, very long time. We have seen thousands of children and families in all our experience of trying to help children who are not managing in school, who are struggling with their behavior, with their mental health, with their well-being, and so they do not fit into school. Our origins are that both Brenda and I um, are teachers or were teachers. I taught in a, a school for the 5 to 11-year-olds, and Brenda taught in a school with the older young people between 12 and 16. Each of us uh, experienced trying to teach children who uh, we did our best as teachers, but we still couldn't find solutions to problems that they were presenting to us in the classroom. I remember looking for solutions, looking for help outside the school, and didn't find anything that was either accessible or was actually helpful for the children I was worried about. And the same applied for Brenda. We, by different routes, ended up in a place that was um, in the National Health Service in the UK. It was a specialist place for helping uh, families. It was a place where the uh, origins of family therapy in the UK was uh, really taking off. It's a long time ago, but as teachers, we were given a very rich experience of uh, thinking about and helping families. From my perspective, it was the idea of thinking about a, a child on their own was, I hadn't seen good changes, but when working with families, I could see changes, could experience changes, and so those of you in the room who know about family style working, it's pretty obvious that that's a good model to work to. What we created at that time was a specialist classroom for uh, children, and we gradually invited parents in who were attending the, the clinic that we were working in, and created the first multifamily classroom. So there were uh, children in the classroom with us, and there were parents in the classroom. And we saw very quickly that this was a very powerful model for trying to help children who were struggling. Over time, this developed a very big or good reputation with the local headmasters, head teachers, and they said that's very well uh, for you in your specialist clinic, uh, but we have far more children in school than you can possibly help in your center. So then we were challenged to say, how could we extend that practice from our center be more relevant and more helpful for children in our local schools. This is when we developed the idea of a multifamily group in school or multifamily classes in school. The uh, terms are uh, used interchangeably across Europe and Scandinavia, the places where we've trained colleagues to set up such groups. The, so these have developed um, in the UK and again these are on a once a week basis, mostly, where a professional such as yourselves, plus a member of the school staff will work together to invite parents together into a, a, a group meeting with their children in order to try and uh, promote the atmosphere, the context, to try and promote change. Okay, that's as far as I've gone that. I'll, I'll start to work through the slides. The, um, what we aim to do for you this afternoon we're going to try and keep our talk as brief as possible, and we will show you quite a lot of film. So we'll show you film of the uh, uh, work that we've been doing. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so just to set us in context, there's a million, it's been defined that there are a million children in the UK who are in, um, have a diagnosable mental health condition, but only a quarter of those get any help. So they're... The, there's been a study by the London uh, School of Economics to show that 90% of the cost of children who are presenting with difficulties is taken by the schools or the education system. 
90% as opposed to uh, so the health system isn't contributing very much. The being a quarter, it's a, so if there's three quarters of a million, million children not getting appropriate help, they are in school and teachers are struggling to find ways to help them. From our point of view, the main findings, we've had um, many studies done on the multifamily groups or the family classes. The main findings that appear time after time is that they, uh, the groups reduce problematic behaviors at school and at home, they improve emotional well-being, they support families to rediscover and learn skills and strengths, and children perform better emotionally, socially, and academically. Now that is a, a crucial point for our practice in schools. Schools in, in the UK, and I guess they are all over the world, are tough places where teachers are um, skeptical, quite rightly, about uh, outside intervention and want to actually see results. The results that uh, they look for as for uh, three things in our experience. Uh, they want behavior to change, they want their academic performance, the children's learning to improve, and they, if their attendance is a problem, they want their attendance to improve. And the last one, that change that lasts by um, creating a model that is a family-centric as family at the heart of the intervention, the change lasts over time. So a multifamily event intervention, it means working with, and I emphasize the word with, working with and alongside other families that have similar experiences. Uh, it is a model, our model is trying not to do things to families, work with them and alongside them. What we've uh, continue to think about the three key elements that are in our practice are trust, we have to develop a relationship of trust to the families, our warmth, it's been shown that for particularly working with conduct disorder or oppositional defiance disorder, that warmth is a key element. So families need to feel that you are on their side and working with them, and uh, motivation, that the group should have a clear drive of what they are trying to achieve child is going to be helped to manage to be happier, more settled, or successful at school, and the parents similarly are going to experience their child being more settled. The idea of working in a group it, uh, is an, in the school, it normalizes the experience for parents, reduces stigma, and further social collaboration, and equips parents and teachers with new resources to tackle problems. So it, it's helping in a wider sense, not only within the classroom or within the school to improve performance, but it is reducing social exclusion or social isolation. The, one of the lead um, comments that parents make after they've been in a group for some time is, thank goodness I joined this group. I was a bit nervous to start with, a bit unsure what I was coming to, but I am so pleased I met other parents who are in the same boat. It's that metaphor that repeats time after time. Parents are relieved to meet others who are experiencing the same difficulties. They're not the only ones who have a child, has a child, difficulty. So who can benefit? Um, I won't read the whole list. It is uh, all the things that anybody will see for a child presenting with difficulties in school. They are uh, familiar to clinicians as well as to um, teachers. So the, again, just to look at the children that we are focusing on, uh, how do they present? They present with a powerful emotion. They are poor at mentalizing. Brenda will say some more about this uh, later in our talk. Mentalizing in terms of they are poor at reading other people's perspective, poor at impact awareness. So um, our model, again, if uh, anybody look into more detail, is uh, a lot of mentalization basis to it which is actually a very good translation across into the school system. It makes sense to teachers as well as to uh, therapists. The children are poor mentalizers. They have, find it, uh, themselves unable to understand or even pay attention to the feelings of others. The others then seem un incomprehensible to them. They try and control or change others. 
and then they're frightening, undermining or frustrating or distressing behaviour. So there's a continual cycle for the children that we're worried about who are presenting difficulties. Right? The impact, just in one study uh, that was done on our work when we were working in the health service, was that um, the parents in the experimental group, either those that had been through our group, uh, had changed they made significant clinical change and academic change, which was sustained over 12 months. I think that was a key finding for us, that uh, the control group, uh, we say on the, here they had changed, but they didn't change significantly. Uh, there was some change, but what was uh, really important for the control group was that they um, got worse over the 12-month period uh, of the trial. So there were improvements in mental health and well-being, improvements in learning and pupil rates of progression and improvements in social competence. That was a study that was done in 2013. Now, just before we move into the film, there's, um, how do I say, that Brenda and I have been uh, in hiding for the last four years because uh, we were asked by the UK government, we set up our own school, a, a full school for children presenting with very complex uh, emotional, behavioral, mental health uh, challenges. So, um, very, using my word carefully, bravely or naively, we agreed to set up our own school. It's been the, one of the hardest things I think we've ever done in our careers. Uh, if we knew then what we know now in terms of what, what was required, it was, uh, it's been an enormous job, but actually very worthwhile. So. Um, we created a school that currently has 32 children and parents attending. It, they are children, all children and young people between the ages of 5 to 14 who have been excluded from school, cannot manage at all in school. They uh, are easily sit with diagnoses of conduct disorder or oppositional science disorder or um, autistic on the autistic spectrum somewhere. So they, they are children that are a problem, if you look at their files, they're a problem for the education system, for the school system, because they can't be educated in the normal system. They're a problem for social care, because so many of the children and young people are looked after by the, by the state. And they are a problem for the health system, because they, they, either they or their parents or their families have been referred for help, but have not actually accessed the help. So what, again, to say what we are trying to create is a normalized, accessible uh, setting for children and parents to get help that they can feel uh, good about receiving, but that is also effective. Now, our, um, why we put this slide up, the, given that we are now a school in the regular system, having been in schools originally, moved into the health system, trained as psychotherapists, so we are both consultant uh, family, family psychotherapists, and then gone back to set up our own school. The school is judged by the government in terms of the full inspection, as any other school would be, and the words on there, which we take delight in, is the uh, line of outstanding. That is, the, the schools are graded uh, one to four with outstanding as being at the top. So this is highly significant for us in the UK, that now government are listening and our, uh, everybody is queuing to come and visit, talk to us about the model of practice. Um, by, the, by the by, we are also um, slightly stressed because we have the BBC TV filming with us, so they are in every day at the moment. So as soon as we try and talk to a child or a parent, there's a, a camera and a, a sound boom over our head. So, uh, so between now and Christmas, it is going to be slightly challenging. Okay, so this is where we'll move into film. We've um, also uh, created an online training for how to set up uh, our multifamily groups or family classes. Cool. So there's a, we've done a lot of training all, all over Europe and the uh, UK. So the request, could we do uh, something that would be remotely accessible? So the online training has over two hours of film, plus background theory and uh, examples of practice that will help um, 
people who want to set up the groups themselves. So we'll show it works. Trailer, which explains how the how the how the multifamily groups work. Family group is, is a group we, we meet with teachers, parents and kids and we do, do some activities, we, we talk, we try, try to find solutions to some difficulties that, that the kids, kids face. I need to ask you some questions, questions for my family group. Can you please tell me something that I'm good at? If I'm feeling down, I always know that I can always go to you because we sort of had the same problems. Before uh, joining the family group, my daughter, she was a shy kid. Now she's open to give ideas and uh, to help other kids. If they get stuck on some activities, she can tell them how to do it. So she's more confident to talk and to help and to express herself. Human beings evolved to, to live in communities. communities. Developing, Developing multifamily family groups serves as a recreation of, of that village spirit where we create a community that supports each other in raising each person within the community. This is a way to get parents and children together to work on things that they find finding difficult. And it's really fun. It's a fun way of doing it. The thing that's nice about family group is it's in an environment that the children and the parents are comfortable with. It's parents and children working together and the children really like having their parents in school in that kind of fun environment. The reason it works is because we make parents feel safe. You know, they're free to talk when they come and we get parents involved because eventually it's not us running the group, it's the parents running the group. I think, I think it's allowed the parent to um, have, have a better connection with the school. Um, I, think I think they definitely feel that, 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 that closer link with the school. Getting, getting to hear weekly how, how the child's doing is really, really helpful and that, that communication has improved. When parents, when parents are concerned, are concerned that schools are making judgments about how they do, particularly if they've got a child who has got some behaviour issues in school or at home. So I think it just helps that parents see school as being supportive and it's an environment that they feel safe in. I used to come to school and I'd be only a friend because the teacher I know was coming for me. Yeah, every day, day was the same thing. thing. I'd, I'd go, go to the school gate, gate and I'd go, oh, oh God, they're coming, coming for me. So I'd, I'd be on the air and I'd act as a teacher. Because I just thought, well, no, I can't take it anymore, do you know what I mean? mean? But, but I went, went to the group, gave, gave it a go, go and, and it did really help. help. And any parent, I think, with some uh, behavioural concerns, you feel, feel like he's the only one who got that child with this kind of behaviour. But when we meet with other parents and they have some issues, maybe more than your child or similar to your child, you feel like, no, I'm not the only one. You really, you really do see changes, changes um, both, both in the parent, in the child, and, and in the school system, system, I think. To see parents, parents that, that you hold your breath when they, they walk through into the entrance hall, or they, they ring, ring you up and say, I need to come and talk, talk to you, and you just have to have a cup of tea before they arrive, because you just know, know what's coming. To see, see them wanting to come in school and laughing and talking to each other and enjoying their children and enjoying communicating with staff, that is powerful. Even, Even though, though we start, start out with, with the premise that it is the child that needs to change, we, we know that through the group, over time, there will come a moment when a parent says, Oh, I get it now. If, if we're going to ask our children to change, then, then maybe, maybe we have to think about doing something differently ourselves. The change that I went through was becoming a person in my own right. Not, not just a mother, mother. Knowing, knowing that I've dealt with other families as well, well giving the advice that I've, I've used on my children, basically, some, some tactics or some things, things that we could use. I think engagement is massive. They, they, they seem to like it. They seem to come week, week after week. week. Um, and, and they seem to get something from it. You know, um, otherwise they wouldn't come back. When, when we first started with the family group, we ended up with like six parents. Then we ended up with other parents that would just turn up on Tuesday. And it was parents just kept coming. It was amazing. My son, My son left, left the group, group and our um, cerebral wants me to come on and carry on helping, giving our parents, parents advice, and that's basically what I was doing, doing. It's giving me confidence to think, oh, hold on, I'm actually sitting here giving other parents, parents advice. advice. You know, you know give me a little, little boost as a mum and, and as, as a person. person. So that's, that's when, when I thought, well, well I can, can do something about this. And I went and got an MVQ2 childcare course, and I passed that at Lone College, which is where I'm at now.
thing that attracted, attracted me to the group, to the group was, was that it wasn't, it wasn't problem, problem specific. specific. So a lot, so a lot of, of groups in the past, past I'd run might have been you know, specific specific for managing, managing anger or anxiety, or anxiety groups. groups. This, this was, was a group, group that actually, that actually allowed, allowed me to target, to target a, wide a wide range of behaviours. So, so we have, have children, children maybe struggling, struggling with attention, attention concentration difficulties, difficulties, children with ADHD, children with diagnosis of autism, children where there's maybe relational difficulties between parent and child, behaviour in the classroom, that kind of thing. But really a wide range. A family worker with three families is much more much more effective, more effective than a family, family worker, worker with, with one, one mother or one, one child. child. It's that, it's that shared, shared, that coming, coming together, together, working together, that is really, really, really powerful, powerful and has, and has to, be to be seen to be believed. believed. We can invest, invest early, early on, on for that, that resource, resource. Into, into a school, school setting, setting at the very, very beginnings, beginnings of when those, those presenting behaviours first surface. The long, long term, term gain is huge. Thank, Thank you for doing another interview with me. I want you to see if I've I've improved. Improved. I've, I've seen, seen a lot of progress with you, Ryan. Ryan. You, you have, have been, been to, uh, sitting so much better in your chair and on the carpet. Because when you look at the arms, you get it all over, over. But, but now, now when you look at the arms, you don't do that. Do you think, think I've improved, improved on my spellings? spellings? Yeah. yeah. Since we were working together or something, I think we got better. I don't see it get odd off. There's been a study, study looking, looking at the societal, societal cost, cost of mental, mental health problems. problems. The, the burden is, is actually 90%, 90 borne by, by schools. The solution, the solution has, has to, to be found in changing, changing the way schools operate, operate to deal, deal with mental, mental health, health problems more, more efficiently, to harness the energy, energy that's, that's in, in the children, children themselves, themselves, in, in the, parents, the parents, and, and in, in the education system for both, both sides, sides, schools, schools and, and children and families, families benefiting. benefiting. Welcome, Welcome to this, this multi-family group schools, schools training. training. This, this program, program is designed, designed to help you with the skills, skills knowledge, knowledge and techniques for successfully setting up and running multi-family multi groups in schools. Okay, so um, I'll just skip down this list very quickly, but um, some of the key features of a multifamily group are, um, is that they, they are a setting to bring people together where they can develop their own community, create solidarity. They say they're in the same boat together. Over overcoming stigma is a crucial one. The idea is still in British society, I don't know what it's like in Finnish society, but the idea of going to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist is, is not really the thing to do. In, uh, but to do, meet with people in school and about their children having difficulties in and with school is uh, often more palatable, more acceptable. So that's, uh, I think our experience is that um, we've seen thousands of children and families over time, and it is unusual, I'm very, I can't think of a time when I wasn't able to work on the basis of a parent wanting their child to do well in school, even if they were overwhelmed with other difficulties in their life, the, the ambition for their child to do well is something that you can actually um, use and work alongside. Creating new perspective, learning from each other, um, being Seeing things in others when you are focusing on one child and family and within the group, other parents may be quiet and watchful and will actually see some things about themselves. Um, I will we'll show it in a second, experimenting with switchover, Brenda will talk about that, but it's again getting parents to work with other people's children rather than their, their own. That's a very powerful technique within a group. And raising hope, I think that is Again, crucial in the sense that um, those of us who are parents, those in the room who are parents, it, it is always very easy to feel like you are in the wrong, that you've failed and that you've uh, made mistakes. Or that, and parents who have children who are struggling in school or have been excluded from school, they very often come feeling like they don't trust anybody. They've felt um, badly harmed by things that have happened in their lives, but also often by the processes, certainly in, in the UK, by the processes of their children being excluded or driven to the margin of school. 
so trust is uh, definitely lacking. So it's uh, a lot of the work is about raising hopes and expectations, dreams for their children. Uh, okay, I'm, uh, you can read those in the program. I think it's more important that we show you some more film. Okay, so today was my turn to start uh, the presentation. Brenda's going to take over for the next bit. Um, good afternoon. I want to share with you a little bit about what we've learned along the way. As you've heard from Neil, we are really quite driven to share as much of this as possible back with our colleagues in schools, but we wanted to make sure that the science was good and solid uh, and that it was uh, a dependable model. And so we've done quite a bit uh, with Professor Fonagy thinking about what is the superhighway to learning? Uh, and as you can imagine, coming from the Anna Freud Center, the idea of a very secure base in which a child learns not just to trust others, but to trust themselves seems to be key. The child that learns to distrust because maybe they've been betrayed or they've just not had reliable feedback over time fails when it comes to many situations where social competence skills are going to be important for them. And without those social competence skills, they fall between some of those self-regulation and those interpersonal skills. And those all almost put a, a block between them and the uh, success of the learning and educational achievement. And I think as teachers, we're quite passionate that good education is therapeutic and good therapy is highly educational. And trying to bring those combined within a system that can sustain change and keep learning has been our superhighway. So well, how did we move from that science into a model? So the model needs to be that people contribute to, as Neil talked about, motivation and trust. That's why you've seen the children with the camera. Uh, we started off by adults deciding how children should behave and how they should improve, and we lost the children. It was just adults talking and adults nagging. So when we gave children cameras and said, you research, you find people you trust, and you come back with what they think you do well, and what might be even better if, then we started to get young people really involved. And there is a, a saying now in the, young, in the young people in the UK, no decision about me without me. I'm very much inclusive in that, even down to our little ones. Then how do we translate that into change? So we adopted from our education, planning action reflection model, and then the importance of transfer, a future thinking model, where and how do I see in these mini contexts of relationships that my new skills might be appreciated and embedded. So we have a target planning action reflection and transfer model. And we're gonna try and show you with some help <laughs> a little bit about that in a second, just to find uh, the right bit on the, on the um, computer. When we talk to families uh, about the kind of direction, many have this plan as children do, you know, this is it, this is where I'm, I'm heading. And as we talk to parents together, we all realize that life isn't quite like that. And if we're going to develop higher order cognition skills in our young people, how are we going to train them to think about thinking, to manage life's disappointments and to problem solve then we need to give them the skills for that. So that's where we moved to, again, looking at what are those key skills. One of the latest bits of research that they had uh, at hand at the Anna Freud that links back to University College London, which links back to Yale, was the idea that when they studied a number of adult mental health problems, adults with difficulties that have actually gone on for years, they found that the adults did not have mastery or confidence with these seven or eight executive function skills. 
when we talk to our colleagues in the classroom, if children had these executive function skills, then the classroom would be much more efficient, lower level disruption, more teaching time, more uh, young people competence. So we think we've found a great integrated mental health and education skills curriculum. The parents and children that come to our school do not come for treatment. When we worked in the health service, that was different. Now we have to frame what is a skill and learning based activity, but underneath that, it's really important for us that that's going to change their opportunities in life to be able to move from not coping to coping to thriving. So, as you can read from um, here, these uh, inner state control, emotional regulation, being able to be organized, having working memory, uh, right down to organizational skills, they are the themes in our planning action reflection model. Right. Now, I'm going to try and show you some little bits of this taken from the... Um, taken from uh, the training. So I think the first thing is just a very simple activity with parents together. Um, this is a group of mums at this stage who have all experienced domestic violence, who are working in a group within the school. And the children were parent watchers. <laughs> uh, and they spent quite a bit of time focused on worrying about what was happening at home. And so in order to create a free mind for these children, we needed to work with whole families. So we... <laughs> oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> um. I'm going to go back one. Okay. Okay, what you're going to see, apparently it's just going to go, is uh, these mothers working together. They're doing a, a composite portrait where you make a portrait, you pass it around the circle, so everybody does a little bit different. And then we start talking about how do you read people? How do you know when people get you? How do you get others? And, of course, this has been really important for children whose uh, security has always been that they needed to read people. But when they came into school, sometimes a concentrating face to them look like the beginning of a route to aggression. she does know because she knows that when she is not feeling great and not able to cope how observant he is and the impact that has on him so you saw in that group we have a psychologist and the teacher running the group after we've done the action we've talked about transfer of skills and where being a great observer is a fantastic skill and where they can 
actually shine with that skill in the rest of the school day and at home. The parents take coffee and then we look at some of the depression, some of the needs of the parents with the psychologists running that group. So that's where we move from action and engaging children in action. I'm going to show you a little bit. You saw the children collecting their, their film. Uh, I'll just show you a little bit of how that works when they bring it back to the group. So again, we've got a psychologist and a teacher working together, running the group, and they're bringing back the film as a kind of review process. How are we doing? How far is it getting? Okay, okay so, so welcome, welcome everybody, everybody to week, week five. five. Uh, uh, this, this week we're going to be watching the video. video. We've, we've had um, Ryan, Ryan and, and Erin. Uh, out, out on, on, on a report, report. you've been, been uh, interviewing, interviewing, haven't you? you? You've been interviewing uh, some, some, some people, people in school to hear about how, um, how, how things have been going, uh, hear what people have noticed, um, and, and just, just get, get some feedback, feedback really from, uh, from, from the progress that they've seen over the last five weeks. So we're going to watch that all together and then we'll have a bit of a chat about it. Okay? Have you seen anything that I've improved uh, since I last interviewed you? Yes, sir, and your behaviour has improved. Um, the way you um, set up um, arguments with your friends. Um, for instance, the other day when Rachel was annoying you, she seemed to be annoying you. Um, and instead of shouting at her, you were talking to her calmly. And then you resolved the situation. That was much better. Have I improved on my chatting? Have I stopped or have I gained more? No, your chatting in the lunch hall has definitely improved as well. You tend to eat dinner a bit quicker now and go outside and chat with your friends. Which is good. Okay. I'm glad you think I'm improving. Do you think there's something else I can work on as well? Um, the only other thing I think you'd work on is trying to make your circle of friends a bit bigger. Because you tend to play or hang around with the same people all the time. So if you made other friendships with other people, that'd be quite good. Do you think that any of my other friends have re uh, seen the difference? I definitely think the people that you argue with um, have seen a difference in you. Um, like I say, the, the way that you solve problems now and um, end arguments, they also tend to calm down. They obviously don't shout as much either. So, so yeah, yeah, I think that you, you've been a positive um, model to look towards them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just, just keep, keep going, going there, just keep going the way you are, um, and yeah, yeah, you're doing really well. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Banks, for your time, and I hope you have a lovely day. Okay, okay so, so we're, we're going to review, review what Miss Banks, Banks said, and, and if, if everybody's not sure what Miss Banks said, she's the senior dinner lady. lady. So, so she, she said that Erin's behaviour is better, she's, she's talking, talking more calmly, not, not chatting so much in the dining hall. hall. So, so she's really impressed with your behaviour at the moment, moment. So, so you've really made some good changes there. Mm -hmm. And then the one, the one that she says that you still need to improve is trying to make your circle of friends bigger. Has anyone else kind of felt that, that they would like to make more friends? That it would be nice to make more friends? Ryan, you're nodding. Yeah? yeah? Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's something that other people have felt that... that one. So, so it's, it's nice, nice to sometimes, sometimes uh, uh, make, make friends, friends with different, different people, new people, but sometimes, sometimes it's, it's quite, quite tricky, tricky too, right? right? Yeah. yeah. My idea is, do you want to tell um, Aaron? when they get upset, um, you can go to them and say, it's okay, we will make new friends, and if somebody's angry, they can say, you can say, um, that's fine, you can, um, um, it's okay. We, you can um, try to not be angry. Any, anyone else have ideas about how, how we can make, make our friendship, friendship group? It is lovely making new friends, isn't it? Brooklyn, Brooklyn do, you do you have, have any ideas? ideas? Yeah. Be nice to them mm -hmm. and don't, if they argue, don't be upset, don't push them or do nothing. But to not be friends with them because when Do I you want to tell Erin? When I got friends, I only had one and then I got loads because 
when we used to be nice to each other, and then we've been being friends all the time. So then you grew, your, you started being nice to more people, and then you became, you got a bigger group of friends. Lovely. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan do you have any ideas? You, you can go, if you see um, someone crying, you can come up to them and ask them if they're okay. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good idea. idea. That's, that's really, really important, important, isn't it? Like, like Amira, Amira was saying, saying if someone's sad, um, so, so being, being a good, good friend would be maybe comforting them. them. Lovely. lovely. And uh, Yusra, we've got, got a... Yusra, Yusra, would you, would you like, like to tell Aaron an idea too? So if you see some, do, someone by um, their self, you can go and ask, do you have any friends? And if they say no, you can say, um, you can be my friend. And then you start talking to each other and say, what's your name? Then you'll be best friend. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that's lovely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's nice. nice. So, so noticing if someone's on their own, maybe, and going, going up to them and taking, taking the first step. step. Erin, how does all that sound to you? There's some really nice ideas there. What do you think? I think it sounds good because that can really help me make new friends and not stick with the same person all the time. Mm. Okay, so we're just going to watch. Um, so Erin was interviewing, was it your friend? Yeah, yeah. so we've got um, an interview with Erin's friend to hear a bit about what she's noticed. So we're going to watch that now. So, hi Demi, thanks for joining me again. Remember when... I last, I last interviewed, interviewed you yeah. about my behaviour and everything. Yeah. How do you think I've improved? Well, I'll start here. I think you have improved when I said you're about your behaviour in class when you were chatting. You've definitely made an improvement on that. I'm a friendship with the fact you have stopped you. We keep secrets and you do not tell anyone. Do you think I've improved by not getting into any more arguments? Yes, Ellen, I do think you've improved. And you've improved by... If someone else is having an argument, like from other people, you, 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 tend, you, you tend to walk away from it so you don't get involved with children. Yeah. Okay, Demi, I'm trying to get better at things. Do you think there's anything else I could improve on? Yes, and it is. Well, if, if something else tells you a secret, don't come telling me if it's about me because I don't want you to get in an argument. So, so thank you, Miss for... Great. So, uh, and so, uh, they pick up as many ideas as possible uh, and that get shared within the group. And one of the things about the multifamily group is that you're not always uh, just targeting one family. Families learn lessons from each other uh, and think about living proof from each other as well. Just trying to, just try and show a bit of transfer. Of the yeah. Now we're going to look at an example of a group. So just a tiny bit of help to think about future thinking and transfer. Even if it's uncomfortable. With this, make, make sure it's exercise. exercise. We explore, explore what might happen if a parent received a positive phone call from the school. What we're going to do, us, is if you went home tonight. So this is just the teacher asking them to future think if they're going to go home tonight, what might be a great message for their parents to hear. And we use a speed date formation. Looking at Neil and I, you're absolutely right. We know nothing about speed dating at our age, but we have worked with younger psychologists who've told us that this is the way that you can have multiple conversations and get to know other people. So as our children rotate around the star formation, they get to have a number of new contexts to understand others and understand themselves. Uh, and it works really well just for planning as well as... Uh, uh, as we think, sort of future thinking ideas. So you'll just see the children go around just imagining what kind of wonderful message, what success, what thriving uh, information may come back to their, parent, to their parent, and then they come back to their own parent and try it out. And, and there was a phone call from, from me, me. Yeah, yeah, saying, saying oh, they've, they've done, done really well today, absolutely amazing, they've, they've had, had a brilliant day, day. I, I can't tell you enough. enough. What would I be calling about? So you have to discuss with your mum. What will I be calling you about? What would that phone call be? To say they've done absolutely amazing today. 
The CBD format adds pace and direction to this transfer exercise. The aim is to help each child imagine the state of mind of their teacher and parent. And this future thinking starts to help a child to keep their parent in mind when they're in lessons. Imagining a phone call home invites an excitement to the prospect of a better relationship experience if effort is put into achieving their goals. Okay, so we're all back with our parents. Um, what we need to do now is we're going to go around and we're going to tell our parents what great news they will receive from me via a telephone call maybe this week. Hello. Hello. Hello, is this Erin's mum? Yes, speaking. Um, I, have, I have a really good call for you. Okay. It's about Erin has been listening well, not talking to Cynthia, and she's also been uh, uh, completing her work perfectly, and uh, She's done two full pages of English. Oh, that's excellent news. I'm so proud and happy to hear such wonderful news. OK, thank you. Bye. Hello. Hello, yes. Is this sister's mum speaking? I've got some good news for you. Your sister has been finishing her work on time and not getting distracted by other children. Oh, oh fantastic. fantastic. I'm really happy. You, you made, made my day. day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Okay. So, um, those of you who are interested can go on the Anaproid site and have a little bit more uh, time with the online training. We have a, a manual that's there that we are uh, going to maybe get translated that will give you some real key aspects of how to run the groups. So for example, this is about how you work your timings beginning at the end. Uh, and that's probably it for us. A very quick cook's tour of um, 40 years of practicing making mistakes and uh, sharing ideas. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda and Neil. Please stay there. <laughs> Um, thank you for this, for this very, very important presentation. It was very interesting to hear that uh, your work not only has significant improvements on the children, but also the parents, so that they are not that afraid to come to school to face the uh, teachers, but also not that afraid to face the difficulties that the children have. Uh, we have some five or seven minutes for the questions. I told them before that if you ask Finnish audience that do you have any questions, they will have none. But now you can present your questions either in English or Finnish. Eli käännämme mielellämme kyllä kysymykset. Olkaa hyvä. This is kind of what I was afraid for. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Brenda Neil. I'm um, Jukka Mäkelä from the uh, National Institute for Health and Welfare. Um, these uh, family groups have been translated to the Scandinavian system in very innovative ways in, in Denmark and in Sweden, where the normal school system has these uh, as a regular way of, of giving support for children with difficulties. Could you just give a small introduction into, into what you know about the, uh, the ways that the D Danes or the Swedes are doing this in, in, in mainstream schoolwork. Yes, I, I think, again, with saying the use of the word family class or family school gets interchangeably. So I think what we've tried to present today is the, um, the underlying principles of all of the um, uh, interventions. Uh, so the family-based intervention and the group-based intervention. And I think with the idea of developing competencies uh, in the children and families. Uh, what we've seen in, uh, in Denmark particularly, they will run family classes either uh, one day, two days, or three days where children are withdrawn from their, their home school uh, for special experiences in the, in the family, 
family class. So it, 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 it's the same sort of principle, but uh, just different degrees of amounts of time, I think. Also, um, in Denmark, they've been run by teachers and pedagogues. In Germany, they've been run by teachers and social workers or social care workers. Uh, and uh, we did start a little bit in Norway uh, with psychologists there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and in the south of Sweden with, again, psychologists, family therapists working together with the school. But I think it's trying to adapt. I mean, basically this is a community of families trying to work together where you are building social care, mental health and education, weaving together for success for the child. And so it depends on the context. Um, I was saying the other day we know that in the north of Sweden they have a, a family, multi-family bus that goes around the village. They've been incredibly creative, particularly because the children are not always in school when they have to help uh, on the farms. Uh, and they've, they've done something that's absolutely right for their community. And, you know, we'd be very excited to hear if there's something that you develop here that, that fits your schools. But it's about creating context, you know, who, what, where, when, bringing those elements together. Uh, I, think, I think we... I think we agonized for a long time when we were developing the training <coughs> as to which professional group we would target. And so we've kept it incredibly wide. So it can be for teachers, for uh, support people in school, whatever, however they're defined in whatever culture, social workers, therapists, psychiatrists, child psychotherapists. We've had all professionals actually uh, delivering groups different in, in the UK and across different countries. So it, it should be an accessible training. And uh, it is designed for anybody who has responsibility or some concern for children who are not managing in school. If they are within school, fine, or if there are external professionals who are expected to do that, then that's good. If uh, one of our other big ambitions, clearly through this practice, is that in uh, any partnership working, that if it's an external professional like a psychologist or a, a social worker or a therapist, they will be influencing the thinking and practice of the colleague in school trying to build a wider um, family systems based uh, understanding and framework of practice across the school. I think when it hasn't worked so well, it's when the multifamily group has stayed somewhere as a separate group and the staff of the school don't feel included because it's an inclusion model, a social and educational inclusion model. Uh, so we encourage uh, the, the people who are running the group to also run trainings for staff, to invite staff into the group, and to see the academic importance of this superhighway to learning, uh, and hopefully the improvement in any class disruption that's getting in the way of the teacher's mental health as much as anything else. Um, another thing we haven't said. So just one last thing sorry. before you. Sorry. One oh, last just in mentalizing basis, one of the things that is crucial for the groups we haven't <laughs> said, but there's uh, an element that is playfulness. They, they, they should be fun because the children come with complex, complex situations. The ones you saw on screen would be classed as early intervention in the sense that they had some problem within their main school, but there are different gradations of difficulties to work with. And when the situations are quite serious and children are... Um, suspicious about where they're going to. So it's trying to bring elements of faithfulness and fun in. Living. And living. Okay. Um, one thing you really didn't uh, talk about a lot here is money. And actually this morning I was talking with them and they pointed out the one thing that later on came from Matti Kaivasoja, from Maria Kausa Aula, from Isma Korhonen, that there are piles of money in, in education and piles of money in social and health department, but they really don't meet or match anyway. And I hope that you have a, a one-minute pitch talk about how should we do it here in Finland. I, I, yeah, I mean, it is a problem. It continues to be a problem that our health care, our social care, and our education department do not talk to each other. 
and even if they want to talk to each other, they're driven by budgets that come top down. And to build an inclusive agenda for these children, we need to find another mechanism to, to build around the child, a community around the child. What is the structure and how do we finance that structure? Because I think that over the years we've been absolutely convinced by the economics of this. The children improve. They become citizens that in our society, these are the bottom 10% where the gap gets wider as time goes on. They don't become useful citizens in the end. They maybe don't have the competences that we would like for the next generation of children. So the importance of thinking about building family competence for social inclusion and educational inclusion, the, the economics is a in English, a no-brainer. It saves money in terms of youth justice, adult justice, adult mental health problems, and next generation. My, uh, my, <laughs> my ten-second pitch in relation to it again. It's, uh, um, Peter Fonagy said it to us that uh, families are cheap, but the most cynical. If you have, uh, as it's seen on the trailer, if you have a therapist or a colleague from school working with six families at a time, that is very cheap. And if you have parents there working with you and alongside you, for you, promoting change, then they are free. Thank you. As a closing, I say that very important learning from here today is that the super highway to learning is... Okay, one more there. Um, Super highway to learning is to believe in yourself and believe in your skills. And, and that is something I think should also be written in here, Maria Kaisa. We have to think about the beliefs that we believe in ourselves, our children believe in themselves and their skills. One more question and then we go on. Okay, thank you. I have one question and one short comment. First of all, thank you for your excellent work and your very inspiring talk. Uh, we were wondering, do you have this uh, family class for teenage students? And then um, we have this uh, Finnish Art Association, aggression treatment, aggression replacement treatment, and we are planning in northern Ostrobot near this uh, family ties training in Ascent in essential skills, which is um, also about social competence that includes families and teenage children or students with uh, behavioral problems. So we have a conference coming 20th of April. So if you are interested, we are getting some excellent speakers from Norway on social competence. So uh, more information on that in the Finnish Art Association web pages. You're all welcome. So, congratulations. The, the, the short answer is yes. To, uh, we have groups uh, running with adolescents. Um, in family systems terms and uh, life cycle stages, it is obvious that, uh, as everybody knows, that adolescence is the time for individuation and, uh, and, and separation. So children and young people become more autonomous. And our wish is uh, Families that we see <laughs> are uh, so it, it isn't it isn't so natural to bring parents and families together because parents are also working on the same basis of individual individualized. Um, but you can because the young people are often not making the transition successfully as anybody would experience working with adolescents. So yes, we do run groups in school. But that's okay. Yes, sir to very quickly tell you about Malachi, who's just graduated from our school. So he went into care when he was six. Uh, he's now 14. He had 22 placements in care. So he went into care because of the violence in the family. He was angry. He, uh, in his words, trashed every placement that he was in because he wanted to go home. His comment was, if you're a regular teenager, and you're angry because you want to see your parents, and you smash up your bedroom. Maybe in a family where it's normal, you might have your money taken away, or you're grounded, translates. 
But what happened to me every time was that all my things were put into a black plastic bag and placed outside the door, and I was moved on to the next, be the next basement. So, yeah, bringing families together that have had painful, much longer experiences, and adolescents who think, I just want a family, and I want to feel secure. Yeah, we have to work with drugs and alcohol-related problems and much more violence and the impact of gangs and the influence of that with our, with our older adolescents. But in terms of bringing families together, mothers who have been isolated at home, not knowing where their children are, when we build the multifamily group and they can call each other, have you seen my son? Could you give a message to my son? We build a parental presence for those young people that may have been missing before. Thank you for this super exciting speech. We have so much to learn from your model. Once more, let's get up and, and applaud. Thank you.